Hello. Hello. Well, welcome to the Producer Skill Conversation with the creative team behind Emperor. We want to thank Sobini Films and Briarcliff Entertainment for making this event possible. It is my pleasure to introduce our moderator. Scott Mance is a longtime member of the Producers Guild and he is the recipient of the Press Award from the ICG Publicist Guild. From 2000 to 2018, Scott was a producer for Access Hollywood and currently Scott is the contributing, contributing film critic for KTLA TV and he is the host of For Your Consideration and You Know That Scene. Welcome, Scott. Welcome, panelists. And please take it away. Thank you so much, Kyle. Great to be back and very excited to have a conversation with the Producers Guild about the making of Emperor. Joining us for this conversation, we have producer Cami Winnikoff. Hi, Cami. Hi, thank you. Also thank joining you. us, he is the Oscar nominated producer and Producers Guild nominee for Django Unchained, Reginald Hudlin. Hi, Reginald. How you doing, Scott? Also joining us, playing, playing the uh, incredible Shields Green in Emperor, Dio Okini. Hi, Dio. Hey, how you doing? Thank you for having me. And also joining us is producer, director, and co-screenwriter, Mark Amin. Hello, Mark. Hi. Okay, well, let's just start. The script is the thing. Mark, how did you come across the story of Shields Green and why haven't we heard about this story before? Uh, the reason I haven't heard about him is because he's very little known character and uh, all the stories that have been, basically his claim to fame, you could say, was taking part in Harper's Ferry Raid. And the John Brown story, Harper's Ferry Raid is very well known. Unfortunately, until now, almost all movies, stories, books written about Harper's Ferry, they were all concentrated on John Brown, his sons, and the white, his white posse, basically. Although there were five African-Americans as part of his uh, posse, and especially the story of Shields Green was the most fascinating one. So what I was looking for was looking, I was looking for, I'd seen of practically every movie that had, done, had to do with slavery. And I, I just, I thought what was lacking was a positive, um, inspiring um, a story of a slave fighting back compared to most of the movies that had been made, which were dealt with the injustice, the misery, the torture they went through. And if you look at history, you see that more than 100,000 slaves escaped and made it and were successful. And that's a small fraction of them. We don't know exactly how many escaped and were captured or killed. There must be multiple of that. So there was all these people and nobody was making a movie about them. Fortunately, in the past two or three years, we've had several. So that's what I was looking for. I was really looking for an inspiring story. And what really inspired me about Shields Green was that not only he escaped, not only he succeeded, but instead of choosing to move to Canada, which is what that's where the uh, fugitive slaves did because they could not stay in Northern States anymore because of the Fugitive Slave Act, which would allow them to come and catch him. Uh, so he was offered literally by Frederick Douglass to move to Canada uh, and live happily ever after as a lot of slaves did. And instead he chose to go back to fight uh, uh, for a much, much bigger cause. So I, th I thought all these things together were just like, it's like an amazing opportunity. And I've always been, uh, you know, just inspired by under, uh, underdog, uh, inspiring heroes who fight against all odds. And I thought this was an amazing thing. Uh, Reginald, I want to ask about your personal history with the Underground Railroad and how that brought you to join forces with Mark in the making of Emperor. Yes, um, I have an ancestor um, who was a conductor on the Underground Railroad. He was in St. Louis, uh, which is my hometown. And, you know, he was a way station. So he would take folks in, hide them underneath the house, and then, you know, send them on to their next location. So 
uh, you know, our family has always been a very politically active uh, family who's always put education first. So <clears throat> the combination of those two things, I mean, uh, my older brother had a, a Fred Hampton poster up on the wall uh, when I was a kid. So I've always gravitated toward these types of stories. So when I read Mark's script, I was like, oh man, this is exactly the kind of story I want to tell. This is fantastic. Um, I know that people say, oh, I'm tired of slavery stories. And I go, yeah, me too. But this isn't that. This is a freedom story. This is a story about people who are taking charge of themselves and, and, and you know, really making the promise of America come true by fighting for freedom. Uh, Cammy, I want to ask you about the tone of the film. You know, when you think of uh, a biopic for slavery, this is not the sort of tone that comes to mind. This movie feels more like a, uh, an action film. It feels more like a Western. I, I wanted to get your take on, on moving forward with the, with the film in that direction. Well, you know, we were developing this film for quite a long time. Mark had had this idea um, a while back. And at the company, we were so excited to make this movie because it just had such a bigger meaning and it felt so important. Um, and so I think one of the things that Mark and, and Pat really did brilliantly was they had this, this, um, this tone, this idea, this theme of having very unexpected things happen throughout the story. So it wasn't, the film was not at all, the film is not at all as you expect it to be. You meet characters along the way that you think that you start out thinking are friends and they wind up being foe. And you have characters who wind up, you think would be, you know, Shield, oh my God, he's just gotten himself into the biggest uh, problem and they wind up helping him. And so it's, it's really, um, the story keeps you not only guessing, but also has something very important to say about your preconceived notion of who people should be or how they should behave. Um, and it takes you in an unexpected, in an unexpected way and on an unexpected journey. It is unexpected in, in all the right ways because it's, a, it's so uplifting. And, and Dio, I wanna get your take on, on your, the approach the film was taking to the, the character of Shields Green and just the physical and emotional preparation for you because you're in like every scene of this movie practically. <laughs> This is correct. Um, you know, for me, <laughs> my my job, I just thought was very singular, which was to portray Shields to the best of my ability, which was to give him as much humanity and to give the audience as much of a reason to go on this journey with this guy. Like you say, I mean, we, we follow this character on his shoulder throughout the whole film. And, um, you know, you want to give your, your audience a reason to stick with this guy. And a lot of that was just impacting as much humanity to him as possible. And I remember like, Early, earlier on when, when you know, Mark, Reggie, and, and Cam gave me this opportunity to play this character, we were talking about um, the character and, and a conversation that kept coming up was he's not a superhero. You know what I mean? He's not an action star. Like it, it's, he's very much in the vein of the everyday man who finds himself in extraordinary circumstances. And a lot of that was in how the physicality of the character. I remember Mark and I talking about, you know, we actually wanted to lean him out because my, you know, your initial instinct is, you know, you want him to be, you know, stoic and, you know, just rip beyond belief. And it's like, no, we're going to strip all that vanity away. And actually it was more of losing weight, which is more, um, which, which is more in line with, with the diet that they had. So it was doing the diet. What is the diet of, of, of a slave during that time? And mm -hmm. what would their physicality be? And remember we're talking about having a, a soccer player type of a body, which is very lean and it was a lot of running. So prior to this film, I mean, I was, I was running almost 120, 130 uh, miles uh, a month. Um, so, you know, every week I'm doing six, seven miles, 10 miles. And so I just got in that rhythm. And even in Savannah, Georgia, I was running every morning and I would just run around and I would listen to, um, to music on my, on my AirPods and, and just Savannah, Georgia is a place that's so trapped in history. And you can just, 
you could just feel the ancestors just, you know, and I would pray for inspiration. Literally, I would pray for inspiration on these runs before going into work. And then just doing your, your research on not just the time, but on, you know, post-traumatic stress and, 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 and because it's everything. It's how the man walks, how he talks, how he maintains eye contacts, eye contact with fellow slaves and with, you know, slave masters. And there was a lot of uh, research on trauma, especially with, with young children who, you know, because I mean, there's nothing like slavery today in terms of research. There's very little that you can research today that would give you that mentality. So you just have to draw on a bunch of different things and the, the very few bits of information about Shields that's out there. Um, Frederick Douglass's book, where he talks about Shields being an example. So yeah, it was without a doubt a feat, but I'm an actor and this is what I love to do. You know, the research is part of the job and, and you know, changing your body, changing yourself and creating something that hopefully can stand the test of, you know, um, anything um, was, was, was a dream job, honestly. Well, to run, to run that much in Savannah, in that heat, yeah. you are a brave man, mm -hmm. my friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was conditioned for this film, honestly, because when I read the script, every other page is run, 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 run. So I'm like, I gotta start running. So yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I have to say, Dio, your performance in this movie is is absolutely fantastic. And Reginald, I want to ask, like, when when you were all looking to cast Shields Green, and like, what made Dio the the perfect shields, like like what made you go like, this is our guy. Reginald, let's start with you on that. Sure. Well, you know, the right actor takes the role, right? You just go, well, I mean, he just took it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, Dio came in with complete, complete command of everything that the character should be, which is uh, an intelligence, uh, an ability to you know, let go of all the contemporary world and put himself in that time and place. Um, a steeliness that made us root for him. Mm -hmm. uh, a moral compass, which is essential to any hero. Uh, he had it all. Uh, and we just thought, well, there we go. Um, how lucky that this young man came in to uh, knock the skin off the ball. So, <laughs> you know. Wow. Well, I, Mark, what about you? Like, what was your take on, on, on diet? Like, you know, you, this, he's in every scene in the filming, you know, like just to, to get that right actor, like what made uh, him in your uh, opinion. Okay. I'll be real honest with you. That was my most insecure feeling uh, when I was approaching to make this movie. Uh, I have produced many movies, been on the sets and everything. I was pretty confident that I could get every aspect of the movie right. The part that was most insecure was getting the performances right. Because, it was, because you know, when you are on set, the directors talk with actors, not producers always here. I'm not always, on, I've then been on the set of every movie from beginning to finish. So I was really worried about that. Fortunately, I had a great team with Cami and Reggie and a great casting director, Mary Verneau, uh, with, you know, I've known for a long time. And uh, to be honest with you, there was this debate, okay, what, what do we do? So we finally decided, you know what? We, we, you know, the first time director, low budget movie, we're not gonna get big stars. So let's go for the best possible actor. That was our approach. We literally decided, let's go for the best possible actor. It doesn't matter whether, you know, they're a big star or not. And then we auditioned a lot of people, honestly. And I remember Dio, first time, I don't know if it was first time or second time, he actually, well, we did a, a kind of like a FaceTime from New York or, or uh, something. That's right. And, 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 and the thing that you also, um, at least for me, no matter what the job is, no matter who the actor is, at the end of the day, and to me, acting is a combination of two things. You have to have the talent, but in my opinion, like any other job, you also have to have the intelligence. So you can be talented, like, you know, somebody might be really good at dunking basketball, but they're not smart enough. They can never do this strategy right. And what I picked in my conversation with Dio was that not only is a great actor, because he did auditions and we saw him, but he was also super smart. And, and he, uh, to be honest with you, he, uh, he contributed during making of the movie. He would constantly come up with ideas and everything and we brainstorm. And I think he just made not only the character better, the, 
uh, he made the whole script better. And, um, you know, he was fantastic at also take, taking direction. Like he said himself shorthand, he said, okay, we're not looking for a superhero body. We're just working somebody who's been running body. And he would get it. That was it. We could talk short, we could talk shorthand with each other. Mm -hmm. So all of that, we just decided, you know, I mean, there was literally after a couple of auditions, there was no competition. As Reggie said, he literally took the role. You know, that's that's a great point. I'm glad you brought that up, Mark, because I, uh, I want to ask you about the conversations, you know, how, how, how important was it for you and how did that elevate your performance to have producers that were so collaborative with you to take your ideas? I mean, it was everything. It was, it was everything. Um, I, and it was right from the beginning. I remember early conversations with Reggie and Mark and Cami, and it was just about, let's try and make this thing the best thing possible, you know? And, and it was just, you know, when it's on set, when something's not working, let's, 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 let's take a pause. Let's break. Why is this not working? What can we do? How do we, you know, turn it around and, and, and just little things that, you know, you would find on the day. You know, like, I mean, an example that just comes to mind is, you know, we have this motif of, of the bracelet of spoiler alert <laughs> <laughs> of the, the bracelet, um, the, the bracelet, the shield's wife, Sarah wears. I mean, that was something that wasn't in the script and it just came on the day of, you know, I'm there with my wife and it's, and, and, and it's, you know, it just felt like a story beat had to happen there while she was dying. You know, if, you know, if you're on the run, there has to be a part of me that knows I'm not going to be able to bury my wife. If, when she dies and you know how will I reconcile this so I, I have to take something and it was like oh let's just take this bracelet and luckily it was a conversation that you know um, Notori had had with wardrobe as to you know the idea and this is another conversation I've had with a bunch of people about the film is that you know sl s people and I don't call them slaves there were people who were enslaved the idea that people who were enslaved didn't have um, a sense of presentation you know that they they didn't care about how they looked or they didn't care about jewelry or about clothes or about the way they wore their hair and that's not true you know um for lack of a better term vanity is in all beings you know for good or for bad and so we you know people who were enslaved back then did care about appearance and would wear a piece of jewelry even if it was something that they made of, of fabricated from cloth or you know from metalwork and so she had had this whole conversation Tori, i think with mark and with wardrobe about that so luckily that conversation she had been allowed to collaborate on that and then on that day you know going to mark and saying mark i think i would take this bracelet and i think I would. and he'd be like yeah go ahead let's do that and then having that be something that we can call back to scene after scene and almost carrying the spirit of his wife with him throughout the story. That's another piece that just came from, from them allowing, you know, us to be collaborative on set, you know, and, and yeah, you know, it's one, and then at the end of the movie, he kisses it and it's almost like him letting go of, of that. And then taking on this, this, uh, this, this challenge to take over Harper's Ferry, you know, giving his life to, to that cause. So yeah, little things like that happen over the course of the story, but yeah, I mean, the, the collaboration, or rather them allowing me to collaborate on that level was amazing. Honestly, thank oh. you guys. I, don't, I, I know I've said thank you many times, but honestly, like, thank you so much for that opportunity. It was, it was everything. It really I just want to mention something, if I may, uh, because Dio brought up this uh, uh, bracelet. Uh, it, I mean, the reason the bracelet actually worked, uh, we have to give a lot of credit to Cami. It goes to show having mm. a woman on the team <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. really, <laughs> because um, to be honest with you, I don't think any of us would have been so passionate about this bracelet idea. So that was just, <laughs> yeah. I idea let's do it. But Cami is the one who stuck with it and made yeah. it uh, work throughout the whole thing. And I think it's mm -hmm. just from a works fantastic from an emotional point of view. Yeah. Hey, Cami, I want to ask, uh, you know, between the, the three of you, you know, Mark and, and Reginald and you, Cami, as producers, you've all produced a whole lot of movies for many, many, many years. And what were the specific, unique producing challenges for Emperor? Hmm. Well, as much as Savannah was amazing and, no <laughs> and you know, we couldn't have been, we couldn't have had a better team with the Savannah crew. Uh, it was challenging to be in a hundred degree heat and mm -hmm. 
in the middle of summer and nights with, you know, I can remember one time I looked around and definitely Reggie and I were full, full bug suits. <laughs> <laughs> the gnats, that's the right. The mosquitoes yeah. were like the size mm -hmm. of small birds. Um, but, you know, uh, it was, it was, you always look back at those war stories and with a lot of fondness and, and love, loving memories. Um, but, you know, those were the challenges with, with Savannah. We had a lot of swamps and you know, that was, that was difficult. Oh, the rain too. Rain on, rain off, rain. The rain was like, so. How about finding the dead body on the set? Oh my, oh God. my God. Back up. What? <laughs> Talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't All in you know there's... to go there. <laughs> All right, Mark, I'm so following up with you on that, on that um, <laughs> stop right there. <laughs> dead body? <laughs> literally, literally a dead body. We were set up, you know, the Harper's Ferry, the, 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 the fort that we're using. Bones, it was bones. Let me just... there were bones. When I say <laughs> oh. dead body, they were bones. Yes. They've been there, I think they, they put it, we called the police, and they we literally called the police, and it, it been, it's been there, I don't know what. You guys remember 10, 20 years or something? It was for years, yeah. yeah it's yeah. been there for years, but as part of the our crew and everything moving around, I guess somehow I forgot who somebody came across this all these bones and skeleton of a dead body. And yeah, that's yeah. first. And, and, and I learned so many yeah. things of different insects, including chiggers and <laughs> chiggers. <laughs> yeah, from the chiggers. Spanish moss, that's right. Oh, and yeah, in the moss. And we had, you know, the mm -hmm. group who he had the, um, what was that called? That meter that was telling us, okay, the lightning is six miles away, five miles away. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, we had a lot of storms. Yeah. So you got to start and stop, start and stop, start filming, start. So, yeah, from a yeah. performance standpoint, I mean, you're in this scene and maybe your, you know, wife is dying or your son is getting, be oh, stop. We got, we got a storm coming. Oh. Everybody <laughs> clear it out. Dio, just keep, keep that, keep that energy. <laughs> <laughs> and then come back 20 minutes later and try and do it again. Yeah, that was crazy. That was definitely it, 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 was, it was tough. Uh, I, look, I mean, when you're in a swamp, there's, there's no managing what's in the swamp, right? The swamp <laughs> no. is the swamp, right? <laughs> but I mean, you know, the biggest challenge was we were doing a period drama at a price. And, you know, I, you know, I, you know, Cammy and Mark were very confident about what we could you know, deliver for our budget. And I was like, really? <laughs> uh, but, you know, uh, we all worked together. We were all very clever. And we actually did give, you know, uh, 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 you know, an, an amazing amount of production value, uh, you know, within the, you know, what we could afford. So, uh, you know, I think it's pretty amazing that when people see the movie, they just plug in and have a good time. And, uh, and that's why we were in Savannah. They, it's a great historical town with all kind of, you know, locations that are from that era um, and, you know, beautiful, uh, however dangerous, uh, <laughs> natural locations for us to work in. And we were able to put a lot of production value on screen. Dio, that sounds like quite the shoot. And, and, you know, with all those kinds of challenges, how do you think, how do you think that elevated your performance and made the movie better? Everything. You can't act hot. You are hot. You can't <laughs> act like gnats are in your eyeballs. They're there. You know what I mean? Um, it's 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 just it informs everything to the performance. You know, the the plantation wasn't fake. You look up and it is a colonial plantation right there. You know, there's um, I mean, obviously, it's not a green screen movie, but there's there's none. You know what I mean? You're always there. You're in the swamp, you know, even coming down to, which is so funny, I did so many crazy things in this movie, but I, I have a huge phobia for snakes. Huge. <laughs> I would think you guys know that, Mark. And so I was like, you know, there was a scene with the snake and they were like, you know, they're like, hey, die, you know, you don't have to do with the real snake. We can do the fake thing. And, and you know, I, I, you know, I got to be the tough guy. You know, I'm like, no, 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 it's fine. You know, we can do the real snake. And I tell you, the day I showed up on set, and they get the snake wrangler and he opens the tub and I see the snake. You know the scene in Saving Private Ryan in the beginning where they land on the beach and it goes quiet and it's like, <laughs> that happened for real. I looked at the snake and went deaf. And I went, 
So, okay, that's cool. Went back into my trailer, called my girlfriend, and she was like, Dio, you got to do it, okay? <laughs> if it comes down to you and some other guy for an award, they'll give it to the guy who, who did it with the real snake, okay? <laughs> so you, <laughs> we had like a whole conversation. She psyched me up for it, all jokes aside. But yeah, and honestly, I overcame my phobia for snakes on the film. Because after like two, three takes, it completely lifted, honestly. So it's like, you know, talk about the things that we actors get from the movie that have nothing to do with exhibition or the movie coming out. Like there are little personal journeys that you go through while making films. And yeah, honestly, like it was, as soon as we did the first take, it was nothing, you know? So yeah, thanks. Thanks guys for helping me overcome it. <laughs> well, yeah. I gotta say, between uh, you and Indiana Jones, uh, Fear of Snakes, you're in. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am Indy. When it comes to snakes, I am Indiana Jones. Trust Why me. it has to be snakes. Absolutely. <laughs> right. you know, Mark, your, your, your career, you know, the last uh, 30 plus years producing all these films, but here you are at this stage of your career directing your first feature. So what were the challenges for you to wear wear that hat for the first time on top of your screenwriting and producing duties uh you know uh, i mean there were times where i was thinking and people told me said what the hell are you doing uh, <laughs> and literally there are people said why don't you choose a smaller more contained easy movie for your first directorial debut like two people in the room with a drum you know like whiplash and i for me, it was very important, uh, my first movie, and probably it's gonna be true for me if I direct again, uh, that I, I just wanted to have a really heartfelt gut connection to the story. And I've dealt with so many scripts, I just could not find anything else that just touched my heart and my gut the way this story did. Uh, so, uh, but that was the easy part. Okay, we want to do that. We developed the script, but then shooting it, especially this, uh, as you guys have seen the movie, it's very, as Reggie said, it's a very ambitious movie. It's literally action chase movie, period piece action chase movie. Um, so the biggest challenge was for me, especially given my age, uh, be directing my first movie was really the physical stamina, having to, you know, work 15, 16 hours a day and sleep for five hours. And I do, like Daya was saying, I have a habit of every morning when I get up, get up, I have to do a little bit of a run or walk just to wake up and be alert. And I was doing that. So that left very little time for sleep. Um, so I lost weight and I looked like a zombie by the time it was over. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and then people asked me, oh, did you enjoy being on the set? Did you enjoy directing? I said, no, it was the hardest thing I've ever done. <laughs> I, I don't know why people do it. The only reason for me is seeing the end results, seeing what you create, mm. seeing the story, seeing how people react to it, seeing the, you know, seeing your team work together. And I think that was really... Uh, for me, the, uh, the, the reward of, uh, first of all, on the set, seeing all this team that was so dedicated, the support I got from everyone, uh, you know, including our production designer, costume designer, line producer, first AD, all those people. Um, but uh, also, uh, you know, be able to, you know, create the story that was my vision and uh, have, and that was the payoff. Otherwise, I don't think I would have, I could have dealt with the, physical uh, challenge. Reginald, I want to ask, what, why is now like the right time for Shields Green's story? Well, it, it, there's been an interesting shift. Uh, when I first started making movies, it was really hard to um, get a movie made with a black protagonist if it weren't a comedy. You know, uh, that, you know, unless you had Denzel Washington, you know, uh, you know it, it was really uh, a very limited opportunities for black films to get greenlit. Uh, and that's really changed. Now, um, movies of all kinds of genres and all kinds of styles are being made because there's a realization that the market for black themed films, it's much bigger and broader and more global than anyone uh, uh, ever acknowledged before. So my thing is, if you can do it, get it done. Because it's a great story. It needs to be told. Uh, you never know when windows open and close. So let's jump through the window when we can. 
Uh, Dio, how did making this movie change you permanently? Oh, man. Um, you know, you know, there's a part of... A lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it changed my body in ways. I mean, you should see my calves yeah, right yeah, now, yeah. man. After all that running, boy, oh, boy. Um, no, honestly, it's... There are two journeys that artists take, you know, when, when making a film. One is, you know, what it, what it does for your career. And then there's what it does for your personal life. I mean, your career, people look at Dio and they go, oh, he can carry a picture. You know what I'm saying? And, and uh, I'm very proud of that. I mean, it was, it's definitely something that, you know, I want to do more of, you know, um, to tell stories and to be at the vehicle of those stories. Um, uh, it's as an artist, it's, it's the absolute dream. And then just personally, um, th there's something that it does to you, you know, the, the discipline that it takes um, to, to accomplish something like this and, and what it really means to be the number one on a call sheet, you know what I mean? To keep the energy of the set high, you know, I, I would always say positive vibes only, positive vibes only on set. That's my mantra, PVO. And to just, you know, you're, you're in Savannah, like we've talked about with the heat and the, you know, the gnats and the mosquitoes and, and you know, just being in a position where you, you set the tone somewhat you know, of, of what it's like on set, especially if you're in every scene and you're there every day, you know, I, I think it's a huge responsibility, not just to be professional, but also um, to, to set the tone on the set along with the director and other, and other producers, you know, so it's, it's about showing up, it's about doing your job and, and um, excuse my French, just not being an asshole. <laughs> um, that's, that's, that's something that, and just the patience that that requires um, on set every day um, is something that I did not take lightly at all. Mm -hmm. um, and and it, it, it taught me patience without without a doubt um, and patience and, and diligence. Cami, yeah. what was the biggest takeaway for you producing Emperor? Well, I mean, it's a combination of perseverance and uh, mm -hmm. tenacity and um, and teamwork, right? I mean, at the end of the day, I was listening to Mark talk about why this film and it started with him and his love for this story um and then when reggie came on it just grew from there and mm -hmm. you know the whole team at sobini and then when dio came on i mean he brought he brought such a presence and intelligence and every single person that came onto the movie just embodied the passion of this movie and yeah. um and that's why the movie is a great movie because mm -hmm. just every single person was so devoted to to making it to making it this movie well mm -hmm. this this is a fantastic movie and uh, i want to thank all of you for this wonderful conversation for the producers guild dio reginald cami mark thank you so much be safe all the best happy holidays and see you at the next one thank, thank you, you. Uh, thanks Scott. bye Bye, guys. Bye. All right.